Welcome, everybody, and uh, good evening, and thank you for, for joining us here uh, for a National Security College uh, public lecture. Um, we're very pleased uh, to welcome Andrew Small this evening uh, to, to speak to you. Uh, Andrew uh, is a transatlantic, transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund in Washington, D.C. Uh, Andrew works on a, on a variety of issues, uh, particularly China's uh, security posture in a, in a variety of different regions. Uh, he's most noted uh, for his recent book, uh, The China-Pakistan Axis, Asia's New Geopolitics, to which he'll broadly speak to um, this evening. Uh, Andrew is also going to speak a little bit more about some recent developments in the China-Pakistan relationship, in particular related to the China-Pakistan economic corridor uh, that has been part of, of Xi Jinping's One Belt, One Road uh, strategy. Uh, Andrew is, is widely published in a, in a variety of reputable sources, uh, Washington Quarterly, Foreign Policy, uh, and his journalistic writings have appeared in the New York Times uh, as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Andrew to the podium uh, for what will hopefully be a very interesting and illuminating talk on an issue that is, is not often discussed, particularly in, a, in the Australian setting. Uh, so, Andrew. Thanks, Michael. And, and uh, Michael has also been hosting me here for an excellent conference. Um, so grateful to ANU for, for having me in, in town for all of this. Um, I'm going to talk, as, as Michael suggested, um, partly about some of the things that um, I cover in the, the book, which is a lot more on the history of the relationship going through to uh, the present day, but um, also to try to talk through um, a bit about what's been going on in the last couple of years, just to bring all of that up to date. Um, so the China-Pakistan relationship um, in general is a very unusual case in Chinese foreign policy. Um, it's not just China's closest friend, uh, Pakistan, but um, some would argue that it's uh, China's only real friend. Um, so many of uh, Beijing's other relationships are dependent on a particular government or regime staying in power. Um, Pakistan is the very clear exception to, to this, um, where support for the relationship with China uh, extends across all of the major political parties, the army, um, and the Pakistani public. Um, whenever you look around at opinion polls on the China uh, on China around the world, um, there's always this striking outlier case, um, Pakistan, where you always have support uh, p positive views of China at 80 percent, 90 percent, even at, at, at points, um, and that's been consistently true for for some time. Um, it has other kind of peculiarities, and it's probably the only relationship on the Chinese side that's um, run by uh, the army, by the PLA. Um, and for some time, particularly until recently, I think you could argue that it's been one of China's most um, secretive relationships as well. Um, I'm not going to do too much on the history, but I think it's quite difficult to talk about the present relationship um, and, and what's going on uh, there without digging into some of the mythologies and pathologies from uh, the historical uh, relationship through some of its um, early phases as well. Um, so the relationship was really forged uh, around the mutual advantage that could be derived from coordination vis-a-vis uh, -vis a shared opponent, India. Um, it's impossible to imagine the relationship as it looks now uh, without the wars of 1962 between China and India um, and 1965 between um, uh, India and Pakistan. Um, at the same time, you had two very different military cultures um, on the two sides. Um, you have all of these stories from the early days of the relationship um, of Pakistani generals um, asking PLA uh, lieutenant generals to fetch their luggage for them because they assumed from their shabby dress and lack of insignia um, that they must be uh, servants come to help them. Um, uh, but you also had very two very different conceptions of warfare, risk, and strategy um, that has meant that despite this being this uh, despite being this incredibly close security relationship, despite um, this kind of shared um, opponent in India, there actually haven't really been two. Uh, there haven't been any wars where the two sides have really seen entirely eye to eye. Um, whether you look at um, 71, whether you look at Cargill in 99, um, etc. And one of the interesting cases of this does go back to, to 1965, um, where uh, it, it does look from some of the archives that have come out that, in fact, China was willing to intervene um, on Pakistan's uh, behalf um, in this war. Um, but you have this um, visit from Ayub Khan to, to Beijing um, at the peak of the crisis, a secret trip that he pays, and he goes to see 
uh, Zhou Enlai and, and, and others to talk about what Chinese intervention would look like. Um, and Zhou Enlai uh, says, uh, uh, we'll be with you all the way. Um, uh, you just have to be ready to uh, retreat to the hills, um, uh, allow a few cities to fall, um, and we'll continue to give you our backing um, uh, uh, right to the end. Um, and Ayub Khan goes home and uh, very unhappy with, with, with the visit and the, the idea that Lahore could, could fall absolutely unconscionable um, and sues for peace. Um, and that, that degree of... Uh, 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 or in India um, occupying this this central space, but in, in so many ways, um, the, the practical elements of coordination during wartime um, uh, never really fully um, coming off. But you you have nonetheless had this conception of the two front war, and it's still um, a sort of standing concern in, in in India's doctrine. But in practical terms, and um, probably since seventy one, you haven't really had a scenario where it was likely that China would intervene on Pakistan's behalf. Instead, what you got was something that looks like uh, almost a giant procurement relationship. Um, even if the two sides aren't uh, in, entirely joined up in their thinking about India, um, what, they, what, what is there is China providing Pakistan with the capabilities uh, that it needs uh, to play the balancing role that, that Beijing um, wants it to play. And that's a role that um, uh, Pakistan wants to play um, itself for its own reasons um, anyway. Um, so what you have really from 71 on for, uh, for, for several decades is uh, uh, China providing uh, the arms, being the most consistent arms supplier to Pakistan, um, uh, and the, the arms supplier that is willing to supply whatever um, else is going on in, in Pakistan's relations. Um, this is the, the, the all-weather friendship, as it's described, is distinguished from the fair-weather friend, the United States, that cuts off arms supplies in 1965 um, and is seen, of course, as having this um, oscillating relationship. China is there throughout. Um, but in practice, um, for the Pakistani um, uh, army, I think um, for a long time, the best equipment is seen to have come uh, from the Americans. The Chinese provide uh, you know, tanks, and they provide um, kind of lower grade um, equipment, and the higher grade stuff um, Pakistan continues to want to get um, from, uh, from from the United States. Um, and even Deng Xiaoping at a, a certain um, juncture uh, goes and tells um, the Americans um, back in the early 80s, you really have to you really have to up, uh, improve your um, supplies to the Pakistanis. The stuff we give them is, is no good. Um, uh, but there's one really big exception to that, of course, which is uh, the nuclear um, uh, ties between the two sides, um, where uh, Pakistan, uh, where China plays this uh, critical role uh, not only in um, developing um, Pakistan's nuclear program at, at certain critical junctures, um, but also um, and Pakistan did have substantial indigenous um, uh, capacities there. The missile program, the ballistic missile program, uh, China effectively gives to uh, to, to, to Pakistan. Um, uh, and throughout this period, whether on the conventional or the non-conventional side, um, China isn't just looking to sell arms to Pakistan, um, it's also looking to help Pakistan develop uh, its own indigenous capabilities to, to be able to be um, self-sufficient um, in, in, in the means of production of, of these things. Um, and I think um, cooperation between the two sides, um, uh, particularly on this extremely sensitive areas, um, has really built um, a high level of um, uh, trust um, between them. And it's been a very resilient relationship, um, even during a, a period of time in which uh, Chinese foreign policy more, more broadly was rebalancing towards um, other economically orientated um, goals, particularly, for instance, um, through the 90s when uh, China's relationship with India was being normalized. Um, the relationship with Pakistan, despite some real pressures through that stretch, um, persisted. And it's through that period that you get this uh, famous quote um, from uh, Xiong Guang Kai, the uh, head of China's military intelligence at the time, that Pakistan is China's Israel. Um, and it's a quote that comes um, uh, after continued pressure from, from the US about transfers of missiles, transfers of nuclear equipment, and, and, and various other things. Um, and the PLA really, I think, plays an important role through this stretch um, in, in holding the relationship together despite some of the external pressures and despite some of the other elements um, of rebalancing of Chinese policy. Um, but for a long time, the relationship never really fully transcends this very security-centric uh, framework. 
Um, it has its moments. There are many other facets to the relationship uh, as well. I won't spend so much time on them, but you know, Pakistan does play an important bridging role for, uh, for, for, for China at certain junctures. Most famously, um, Kissinger passing through Pakistan and the secret messages convey conveyed um, uh, by the Pakistanis to enable the Sino-US relationship um, uh, to be established. It plays a similar role in establishing China's relationship with Saudi Arabia and um, uh, some other cases as well. Um, but Despite the fact that it um, has been um, a relationship um, of some weight and standing and trust, um, it's been one that, in some respects, China's been um, uh, somewhat sheepish about. Um, reputational issues around the relationship and, and, and the very nature of it, um, the, such a security and intelligence-centric relationship and some of the sensitive um, uh, transfers that are taking place. Uh, the fact that it does complicate China's relationship with, with India, um, of, of course, um, and some on the Chinese side have argued at certain junctures for a more uh, balanced um, uh, approach in South Asia. It also never really takes on any economic weight. Um, uh, you can see this even when you're looking at the kind of most recent round of big promised in investments. Um, you have a period from 2001 to 2011 where if you tot up all the things that China promised to provide to Pakistan, you get to about uh, $66 billion, of which about only 6% actually come off. Um, the uh, of the sort of strategic mega projects that have been been talked about, um, Gwadar, uh, the pipelines, the previous plans for a transport and energy corridor, um, uh, these uh, in the end have, have have had not proved to be successful. Um, and I think you had some uh, doubts uh, creeping in um, in China about uh, certain elements of, of the relationship. Um, in particular, the cooperation on, on managing militancy inside the country um, becomes more and more problematic, um, particularly as Pakistan um, uh, loses control over some of the groups that it had previously um, controlled more uh, completely. Um, and you even get uh, some elements of concern in China about the willingness of the Pakistani army to take action um, over some of the elements that they uh, that they do control and about um, what the long-term trajectory of the relationship looks like as a result. Um, but it's been hard to avoid the fact that despite some of these kind of uh, negative seeming developments for the last stretch, some of the senses of missed opportunity, elements that never fully come off, um, it's been quite clear that in the last year or so um, there's been a real shift. Um, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, very high-profile visit um, the other year, the launch of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, uh, most clearly. Um, but it's been in evidence in, in various other ways as well. Um, you start hearing this uh, somewhat newer language um, used to refer to Pakistan among uh, some of the strategic thinkers um, uh, on the Chinese side. Um, language that Pakistan is China's one real ally um, and the relationship is a model to follow. Um, and you've seen over the last few years um, uh, some relaxation of, of the inhibitions that have previously been there over things like cooperation on uh, nuclear power plants, uh, investments in Gilgit, Baltistan, uh, even about uh, the, 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 the development of Gwadar port itself. Um, what, what explains um, this, uh, this change? Um, I think to make sense of what's been going on, um, I think we probably have to look more at what's going on um, in China and on the Chinese side um, than um, at Pakistan itself. Um, but there have been a few Pakistan-related developments that um, were uh, of, of relevance um, and, and, and have, have, have fed into this. Um, China is always willing to work with whatever government is in power or whatever um, uh, army chief is in power um, uh, in Pakistan. Um, but they have had some um, preferences with, within that. I think there's no doubt that uh, Nawaz Sharif um, taking um, power in the last Pakistani elections, uh, they, 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 they certainly at least initially preferred working him uh, over his predecessor, um, Asif Sadari. Um, you also had a period of, of time in which there was actually, despite what for a, a stretch of time had been, Pakistan for, for, for a few years was probably the most dangerous uh, country in the world to be a Chinese worker. There were a number of um, successful attacks by the Pakistani Taliban in particular, some of the Baluchi groups before that. Um, you then have a number of years in which um, there is actually a lack of um, successful attacks on, on Chinese workers. Um, and um, security threats in Pakistan, um, generally, um, the situation there has, has um, uh, improved um, very notably in the last um, uh, couple of years. And you also have the removal of what was really a standing irritant in the relationship, which was that the group, that the one uh, terrorist 
um, group that explicitly targeted China had its base in Pakistan, China's closest friend for the better part of a, a decade in North Waziristan. Um, and a couple of years ago, you have the Pakistani army's operations, Zabai Azab, um, which uh, displaces pretty decisively um, uh, the Pakistan Islamic Party um, from, uh, from Pakistan. Um, but the more important drivers in the relationship um, in, in the uh, in, in the last couple of years have really been on the Chinese end. And Pakistan has been partly uh, a, a beneficiary by, by chance. Um, I think the first general trend is uh, friends count for more. Um, as strategic competition with the US in particular um, has been intensifying, um, China's relatively, uh, I think, um, inadequate approach to sustaining friendships, uh, let alone um, uh, alliances, uh, is increasingly understood um, as a disadvantage. Um, and you only need to, to look at a, a few of the recent cases, whether it's Burma, Myanmar, uh, Sri Lanka, and a few other cases to see that, um, in some respects, the developments for China in that in, in that uh, sphere for the last um, in the last few years have, have moved in an adverse direction. Um, but also, as China looks to develop more out of area uh, capacities, whether it's naval facilities um, or even partners on the uh, new proposed counterterrorism operations, um, these kinds of security partnerships that still fall short of a formal alliance um, have become an increasing focus. Um, and when you uh, look around the world at countries that fall into this um, category, uh, Pakistan's really in a, a tier of its own, one of the uh, only uh, countries where you have uh, a relationship um, of sufficient trust um, on the military and intelligence side. Um, the second trend has been, uh, which is one of the subjects of the conference that we've been um, uh, discussing uh, growing concerns, particularly since 2009, um, about stability uh, in Xinjiang um, itself. Um, and I think you can see the uh, very difficult early phase for Xi Jinping's presidency in, in, in this respect, whether it was uh, the attack in Tiananmen Square, the attack in Urumqi, just uh, as his uh, flight is taking off, um, uh, and a couple of these uh, other cases, which also plays into a kind of a longer term uh, trend about the concerns about the impact of developments in the neighborhood, um, not necessarily just in the short term um, on Xinjiang, but over, um, over the longer term, particularly um, Afghanistan in the context of the, the US drawdown. Um, and the sense has been, um, I think, that um, uh, achieving um, some level of stability um, in Xinjiang um, over time will require um, also achieving some degree of uh, stability in China's western periphery, and that the, the risks in China's western periphery um, for Xinjiang are, 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 are very significant. Um, and that includes um, uh, doing so through these kind of Marshall Plan style efforts through Chinese investment and financing. Um, the third trend, I think, has been the shift in the Chinese economic model, um, the domestic downturn um, and longer term economic transition um, that's underway there um, has necessitated this push to address the problems of overcapacity, low returns on investment at home, um, through building new markets abroad, finding new growth drivers in the Chinese interior, um, and moving away from what had really been the previous pattern of large-scale outbound natural resource investments um, towards increasingly industrial and infrastructure projects. And of course, all of these factors have converged in many respects in the, the Belt and Road Initiative um, and in the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which has um, ended up becoming the flag flagship project for this entire initiative, as, as described um, on the Chinese side. And I don't think this is because uh, CPEC um, is, uh, and Pakistan is necessarily believed to be the ideal place to showcase the, the Belt and Road. Um, when you hear about some of the internal assessments on the Chinese um, uh, side con uh, conducted by its security um, services, by MOFCOM and, and, and others, they've been relatively pessimistic, I, I think, about CPEC's prospects. Um, but Pakistan um, has, a, has a few traits that uh, are important. Um, first of all, it's one of the only places um, uh, that China's been able to find um, uh, where you have a country that is willing and receptive to investments on such a large scale um, and in a manner uh, that China wants to see them happen including, for instance, privileged position for Chinese companies um, in bidding processes and, um, and some of these sorts of things. Um, uh, so uh, when you look around at all of the um, other Belt and Road uh, cases, 
Uh, there are no other instances, I think, where you get this kind of multiple tens of billions of dollars of planned investment um, uh, on quite such an ambitious scale. Um, and it's also one of the locations where the potential political and strategic benefits um, uh, of pushing ahead with some of these investments are really seen to be worth the costs. Um, there's a couple of elements behind that. Um, first of all, a stronger and more normally functioning Pakistani economy um, is seen by China as reducing the risks of um, extremism in, in, in various different ways, um, and some of the traditional elements to the relationship too. Um, I think China believes that Pakistan can't sustain its balancing role entirely effectively um, if its economy um, continues to go on its previous trajectory. Um, the thing I do not include among the primary strategic benefits as seen on the Chinese side um, uh, in this uh, to such a degree is this big question of the connectivity from Xinjiang to Gwadar, um, uh, which I don't actually think is as important um, uh, to, to China, even though it's clearly an important part of the mythology and symbolism around uh, CPEC, and we can talk about in, that in the discussion afterwards um, about why that's the, the, the case. Um, what does some of this translate into? Um, first of all, it means that the Chinese commitment to uh, a political energy to the relationship is much greater than it was. Uh, to take the most obvious case, unlike um, uh, the previous dynamic on economic projects um, uh, in which essentially if a project wasn't going uh, well or was running into problems or was running into security concerns, it would be used as an excuse to uh, stop the project um, altogether or slow it down. Um, at the moment, uh, CPEC, um, uh, whatever uh, some of its challenges are, um, is being pushed ahead. Um, and it's being pushed ahead despite some of the problems it faces um, rather than stopped uh, because of them. Um, it has effectively turned into a test case, really, for the entire uh, Belt and Road scheme. And therefore, in some respects, for Xi Jinping, personally, given that this entire initiative is his... Um, uh, pet project, um, and uh, what you continue to uh, hear from everyone on on, uh, on, the, on the Chinese side who's engaged in these um, things, every time they're running into the headaches that, 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 that undoubtedly exist around it is still the political need to do this is strong. And if you look at the history of the China-Pakistan relationship, the economic projects that have actually come off, whether it was the construction of the Karakoram Highway, uh, Gwadar Port's development in the first place, the <coughs> nuclear power plants, when there's been a strong enough political and strategic rationale uh, for these projects, they have been the ones that have succeeded. It's been the projects that have lacked that or have had only economic um, underpinnings um, behind them that haven't actually um, ended up um, coming off. Um, I think what you also see at the moment um, uh, is that there's a somewhat greater willingness um, uh, on China's part to demonstrate that being a friend of China brings benefits, um, which has ramifications that go uh, well beyond the China-Pakistan um, relationship itself. And you see it in subtle ways in uh, the UN Security Council, um, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, and a few of um, these other cases recently. But I think the, the scheme as a whole is also intended, um, CPEC as a whole um, itself is also um, intended as a demonstration um, that um, being uh, a, a close security a partner of China's um, does translate um, as well into um, some of these broader, large-scale um, economic benefits. Um, in all of these senses, I think Pakistan um, is really a, a clear beneficiary of some of the new calculations um, that are underpinning a few of these elements in Chinese foreign policy. Um, but it also brings with it um, a number of pressures um, for both sides. Uh, the narrow, pretty... Uh, secretive security relationship that used to exist um, between the two sides was also something that could be very carefully managed by a pretty small bunch of people um, in China and in, in Pakistan um, uh, at the political level and most importantly through the, uh, through the militaries on the two sides. Now with uh, CPEC, uh, China's far more exposed to Pakistani politics, uh, to security threats, to public opinion um, and to all of the ramifications of being seen more as a patron than, than China has ever been seen, um, I think, before in, in, in the relationship. Um, and I think China has, in, in, in uh, this early phase, been somewhat taken aback, actually, by the level of political infighting that um, uh, CPEC uh, unleashed. Um, but some of it is infighting that is... 
um, China being inserted into uh, all of the previous fights that existed um, in Pakistani um, uh, politics anyway, just with a Chinese uh, layer to them. Um, but it's a very different status for, uh, for, for China at the moment, although I think there's uh, uh, significant levels of support um, in Pakistan um, across the political spectrum in principle for the entire um, project. Um, in practice, the, the sheer scale and nature of what's being attempted um, is an inherently the, gets into an inherently political set of, of fights, and it's not something that China um, has really been exposed to um, there before. Um, and it's also pushed China, as a result, um, to have to take a more active role in certain respects um, on areas of Pakistani politics that it had not uh, meaningfully played a role before, um, whether that's... Um, uh, questions about the status of particular provinces, um, but even, um, and we've seen that particularly in the, the last few months, questions of civil military relations in, in, in Pakistan, um, where there has been this huge question um, about uh, the role of the Pakistani army um, or otherwise um, in, in running this um, project. Um, so if, if th this is a new set of um, issues for China to manage, and it's certainly also true that the expectations for Pakistan um, have gone up as a result. Um, China wants a stable Pakistan and a stable neighborhood for its investments, and it's meant that China started weighing in on various issues, like Afghanistan in particular, where it used to give Pakistan a pretty free hand, um, virtually outsourcing um, its own policy in Afghanistan um, uh, uh, to the Pakistanis. Um, uh, the last couple of years, that's no longer been uh, the, the case, um, whether it's um, in the bilateral relationship with Pakistan um, or in the broader role that China's playing in Afghanistan. And there's been a far greater willingness for uh, on China's part to weigh in on uh, broader strategic questions um, uh, in Afghanistan in a way that um, is in some respects quite testing for, for, for the relationship. Uh, the traditional, very India-centric framework of the relationship saw the kind of structure of the two sides' interests pretty well aligned, even if it wasn't always uh, aligned on, on, on tactics. Um, on Afghanistan and looking west, um, I think there's considerably greater scope for uh, differences between the two sides on their um, outlook. Um, and we've already seen that um, uh, in, in a few modest ways um, already, but I think it could really be put to the test of the situation in Afghanistan um, or to worsen um, more significantly. And what all of this means is, and just to, 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 to wrap up, the focus of the relationship, which, which had through its really through its first few decades um, been essentially focused on, on, on India, whether it was explicitly stated that way um, or not, is relatively less so um, now. Um, it doesn't mean that the traditional basis of the relationship um, has changed, um, but it does mean that the relative weight of a number of these other issues um, has, has really grown. Um, the relationship increasingly looks uh, beyond even South Asia um, itself to the Middle East, to Afghanistan, to regional stability questions. Um, and uh, of course, it looks even more seriously than, than China, uh, the relationship ever did before inside Pakistan. Um, there's a quote that um, uh, some colleagues here have been uh, fed up with, with, with hearing at the conference in, in, in the last couple of days. Um, but there's uh, when, when Li Keqiang meets uh, uh, Narendra Modi, um, in one of his meetings, he talks about the purpose of the China-Pakistan economic corridor being to uh, being designed to wean the populace from fundamentalism. Um, uh, you, from some Chinese experts, have also had uh, the quote to the effect that um, the goal of CPEC is to transform the social and economic structure of Pakistan. Uh, these may be uh, very noble objectives. Um, uh, but they're certainly, uh, for those who are used to following Chinese foreign policy over a long time, uh, ones that sound a very, very long way away from non-interference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I think Andrew has presented a, uh, a fantastic snapshot of the evolution of the Sino-Pakistan uh, relationship, uh, one that was very much, uh, could be seen as a transactional one in, in some senses, uh, from that era of being a procurement relationship through the 70s and 80s uh, to now, uh, we have a, a range of new dilemmas, particularly for, for Beijing. And in, in that context, there are a range of, no doubt, many controversial questions, hopefully, from, from the floor uh, and enough to stimulate uh, debate. So I invite 
uh, questions from the floor and I'd please ask just to, to state your name and, and affiliation and we'll get the microphone to you. Been about 35 years of service in military and I'm very uh, pleased to see your analysis. First of all, uh, you understand that China and Pakistan friendship is not new. It starts from 1951. It has stood all the tests of the history. I mean, we have been living with the Western world, Cito Sento, war against uh, Soviet Union, and also keeping a balance with China. That is our strategic compulsion, maintaining a strategic balance in the region. And this is every state does it. That is the legitimate rise, uh, right. Secondly, uh, where you, uh, I think uh, you need to, to have more research is that 90% of equipment of Pakistan Army, Air Force, Navy is from the United States, not from China. That is interesting for you. I'm from military man. <laughs> That's good. CPAC should be seen as a, as a game changer, not for Pakistan, also for, from Africa, Middle East, New Zealand, and Australia. One day people will realize that one of the benefits of CPAC for, for the entire world is not, it's not only regional focused. Lastly, I will mention that our relationship with China is on mutual interest. And we respect, we have you know, strategic interests with each other. And China has been a good friend of Pakistan, and Pakistan has been a good friend of China. So it, this alliance is not against anyone. We are maintaining a strategic balance with the United States as well, in the Western world. And we are the front leading country in war on terror. So I believe that uh, whatever Pakistan and China are doing, that it should be seen as handshake for regional stability and security, rather than axis of evils, you know. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I'll kind of semi thank you for the for, for the interesting um, uh, comments on on these things. Some of, some of which I think are um, are, are are fair. Um, I, I think it's it's still um, if you're looking from the Indian side, um, uh, difficult to see the relationship purely as uh, uh, a handshake of friendship. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but um, but on, on on some of the uh, and uh, of course as I as as I was arguing in, in peace it's it, it's a relationship that um, I mean was certainly uh, because if if you go through from from 1951 through the early phase of the relationship there was a period of course in which China's relationships with India with, with India was much closer um, and uh, it's it, it, it's still um, hard to see uh, how the relationship translates into uh, what it ends up translating into uh, without some of the regional dynamics moving in the way that they do including uh, uh, in the first instance um, uh, the China India war um, and uh, that's obviously the juncture as, as well at which suddenly the border agreement with Pakistan is is, is wrapped up uh, uh, purely coincidentally in the immediate aftermath of the war. Um, uh, and um, I, I, I think um, although, uh, although the relationship now certainly looks uh, beyond some of these regional considerations, um, uh, Pakistan, um, as um, uh, one of your... Uh, uh, former uh, chiefs of army staff um, described um, this doctrine has has still had an India centric um, uh, framework for, uh, for for its uh, for, for its own strategy for for some time, and China has provided ballast for um, for that in very important um, uh, respects, and that's been uh, one of the, the the principal reasons that China has been been so willing to to do so. I think. Um, uh, whether one goes into the nuclear questions um, or not, I, I, I think China, the, the degree of integration that China's had and, and coordination with Pakistan, which it also saw as a two-way street for some time, I think China also saw itself benefiting from uh, uh, from, from the process of cooperation on, on nuclear issues with, with Pakistan and itself, including centrifuge technology and, um, and other things. This wasn't just intended as a sort of uh, a one-way uh, street at all. But why was there this willingness to cooperate and coordinate on, um, on on some of these issues. It's the only instance I think you have in the world of a, a nuclear weapon state providing highly enriched uranium to what was at the time a non-nuclear um, state. I think the regional strategic framework has, has still been central um, uh, to that and um, the, the, the questions about uh, the two sides relations with India. But um, as I, I think the, the presentation uh, teased out, C CPEC and, and, and some of these other facets of the relationship really look 
um, quite uh, far beyond some of these traditional um, questions. And, and if successful, I, I completely agree that would have ramifications uh, that could be potentially beneficial within the region and, and, and beyond as well. Um, and, um, and, and certainly, uh, including when I'm um, uh, talking on this subject in, in, in India as well, that's, that, that um, I, I, I think India should also see uh, some potential benefits from uh, uh, the, from the success of, of, of CPEC if it does su succeed. Um, uh, on the proportion of military sales, we can debate the statistics, but let's not. I think we could look at India and Australia. The push of the I would hope further down the line that you could have a, a branch of CPEC that that actually goes to, and, and I, I actually think this, the economic success of of CPEC um, can only be fully realised over, over time um, if it ultimately involves trade with, with, with India and Pakistan as well. But that's uh, another question. Uh, David Murphy from the Australian Centre for China and the World here at um, ANU. Um, I'd like you, if you, if you could just elaborate a little bit more on your comment about um, the connectivity between, uh, the question of connectivity between Gua, the Guada port and, uh, and Xinjiang, mm -hmm. uh, and especially given um, it's not just a matter of port development, you know, there's a special economic zone development there. Um, and also, um, related to that, uh, whether you could talk to it all, whether there's a serious uh, energy security uh, element of um, the relationship, given that uh, part, you know, elements of CPEC, uh, or as I understand, other elements of Chinese investment in Pakistan concern um, the uh, pipelines between Iran and um, uh, um, connecting on, on natural gas and oil, and also just the question of transporting uh, an alternative um, uh, transport of, of uh, Middle East on oil from the Guada port through into, into China that way as perhaps a, an alternative to, to um, transport through the Malacca Straits. Um, uh, yes, uh, uh, interesting question. Um, I'll, there's quite a few facets to it, so I'll, I'll try and stitch a few of the different pieces uh, together. Um, the transit dimensions of the corridor, of the China-Pakistan economic corridor, um, I, do, I still do not see as kind of a central, a, a really central part of the objective on the Chinese side um, for various reasons. I, I, one of the reasons that the Karakram Highway and, and, and all of these things are, are, are so difficult to use commercially are, are purely kind of practical um, uh, considerations about the high mountain passes, landslides, uh, the viability of the route and this sort of thing. So um, you can build some of these things, but will they actually be put into uh, into full use? I, I think it's it's still questionable. There were, one of Nawaz Sharif's first things um, uh, that he talked about when he was talking about CPEC was about building a railway, for instance. Um, I, I think there are still none of the questions about the viability of that route for North as, as, as being the bulk of commercial traffic or even a significant increase in commercial traffic um, have really gone away. And you know, there's better protection from landslides from some of the tunnels have been built and things. But the road is still closed down uh, now routinely um, uh, by, by purely uh, by natural disasters and things. So, I, I, so purely for that reason, um, even more importantly than questions about Balochistan and, and security issues and these things, um, I think there's still a lot of difficulties in, in having this route really come off as, um, as, as a regular thoroughfare. The sea trade is still the preference. Now, I think you do have a kind of uh, the same sort of slightly neuralgic factors that even played into the building of the Karakram Highway in, in, in the first place, which was done during the period in which Mao was kind of doing the, the, the Western push and pulling all of the industry into the, the interior, um, fearing war with the US and all of these sorts of things. I still think that what you're raising about the Malacca Straits and all of these questions, I, I think it is there in the in broad terms in the minds of some of the the, the, the people who are thinking about the entire construction of the Silk Road Economic Belt, Maritime Silk Road, how these things connect. Um, and I think some of these kinds of drawing lines on the map and alternative energy routes and things like that, I don't think that they are in, absent from the sort of, uh, some of the broad thinking about it. The practical thinking about it, though, I, I, I still find that to be much more distant from, from, what's, um, from what's going on. Um, it was actually quite hard to get the Chinese 
companies to take Guadar on again, actually. Um, of course, the Singaporeans were running it for a while, took a very significant lobbying effort um, uh, to get um, uh, to get the port taken on by, by, by Chinese companies. It was one of Zadari's kind of actual, his big achievement in the relationship um, uh, before he, he left office. Um, and if you look at the breakdown of the projects, of course, um, you the larger proportion of them by far are still um, energy projects inside Pakistan. They're not connectivity energy projects. Um, uh, the proportion of it is still, you know, 70, 75% of the projects are projects to help the Pakistani energy sector. Um, the next phase of it will probably be infrastructure, more infrastructure in turn. I mean, Guadar is already a piece, there's some of the road building and things. Um, a lot of the next phase, I think, will be more rail links and things inside Pakistan. They're discussing um, some of this at the moment. Um, but the, the, the proportion of it that is cross-border, new major commercial linkages, um, I think, is still not going to be a, a very significant component of it. And when it comes to the energy piece, so you know, the Iran pipeline, for instance, I mean, I think the Iran-Pakistan pipeline... China may help finance that, as they will finance some of these other things. Um, uh, but I think the purpose for that will be gas for Pakistan. Um, if Iran wants to connect up uh, its energy uh, supplies with, with China, and if you talk to people on the Iranian side, I don't think Pakistan and Balochistan are seen as the, more, as the most natural conduit. You've got Central Asia, you've got sea links, um, uh, you run into the same questions that you, um, you did before. Um, and the line that you get from some people on the Chinese side is, all of Pakistan is a corridor. Um, uh, so this, all of these questions about where is the route going, and this thing. I mean, it's it's there in the debate very clearly on the on on the Pakistani side, um, uh, and there are provinces that want to get more of their share of the proceeds and, and things. I think on the Chinese side, the balance of interest has still been in broad-based projects for the Pakistani economy. And the language. Some people have even said you should shouldn't call it a corridor at all. It's a broad-based investment package. Um, people keep thinking of it as a transit corridor. It's it, it's it's good for the stories, but I'm, I'm still not sure it's the central part of it. And it doesn't, you know, China wants to use Pakistani ports for certain purposes. The, none of that, that that's that that's uh, not absent either. But um, I think the central thrust of what's being done um, is not essentially uh, this kind of draw the line from Kashgar to to Gwadar, and, you know. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Natalie. I'm from the Strategic Studies Department, doing my master's here. Um, I wanted to know what you thought the strategic and security questions that Australia should be asking about this emerging um, dynamic, um, particularly with the shift in the past year. Some might be forecasting uh, strategic and st security challenges for Australia. Um, and I just wanted to know what your thoughts were for that. I'm actually from New Zealand as well, so if you can allude to anything on, on that, that would be really great. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll try and answer it in, in kind of general terms and then there'll be kind of specific application but it's it, I, I think some of these are, are questions that apply to uh, to a number of countries uh, I mean there are some frontline countries where there are a different set of questions um, but for anyone that isn't in the immediate periphery I think um, there's, you know, there's, 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 there's some kind of broader issues in, in place I mean of the developments in the last stretch of time um, you of, of the new pieces on the security side, on the direct military relationship, um, I think the sort of interesting new phase is probably more on the naval piece, um, uh, which I, I didn't really talk about, but um, uh, I, I, I think you, there is, I mean, you just saw uh, first nuclear submarine um, making its call in, in, in Karachi. Um, uh, you saw one of the biggest on sales in, in Chinese history of the submarines um, uh, to Pakistan um, as well. And you're not looking at that just in the conventional side. But Pakistan has been quite explicit about its plans to develop um, a naval nuclear capability, the third uh, leg of its uh, nuclear triad. Um, and as it has been throughout, I, I think China would be would, would play a helpful facilitating role for certain specific, at least technical elements of it, but also in terms of the, I mean, the submarines the, the, the themselves, um, as, 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 as you've seen. So, I mean, there are some interesting developments uh, there that um, I think uh, have ramifications in the Indian Ocean um, for nuclear security questions in the region that I, I think are kind of worth paying attention to. And um, some of the other stuff that I, I, I talked about, I mean, I, I, I think these... I think these geoeconomic schemes, um, CPEX, so we're at economic power, some of these, um, uh, are a significant shift factor in terms of some of the uh, security questions um, in, in the region. 
um, I, I, I think uh, they, uh, it, across a few different um, elements, I mean, there is, a, there is, of course, a long-term question of whether development equals um, stability and, 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 and these sorts of um, pieces. I think they are intended as incentivizing um, in the short term. I mean, I think there's a sense that the region has lacked an economically integrating core, that the security um, uh, dynamics uh, the, 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 the security um, divisions in the region have tended to uh, predominate, and if you have some kind of attractive economic force on the sort of scale that's being proposed, that it might help to recondition some of these um, calculations, whether that's uh, accurate or not. I, I, I think you can uh, you can see at least an attempt to um, put these um, into the mix, and I, I think you have seen um, uh, yeah, around. Um, uh, around some efforts on China's part to um, nudge Pakistan in a certain direction on, on, on some questions, um, uh, at least some efforts um, on Pakistan's part for its own interests as well. And I, 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 this is uh, not just Chinese pressure on Pakistan or something, but I think Afghanistan is one of the central uh, cases for this, where, I, as, uh, where, where there has been an expectation on, on China's part that um, that Pakistan will do more to deliver a, a reconciliation process with the Taliban. Obviously, this hasn't succeeded yet, um, uh, but it's a very uh, it, the the some of the economic incentives that are, are being put in, in in place, not just the economic corridor, but some of the promises for Afghanistan um, as well, are really one of some of the only new factors that are coming into to play on 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 these. Um, on, on these questions, um, so uh, and I, I think I mean this is one of the things we were looking at in, in the conference um, uh, in, in, in general. Um, there, there is just a question um, that is shifting about how China thinks generally about counterterrorism issues. China has not been uh, a close partner in um, really in, in, in trying to address some of the systemic questions um, around militancy in this region or anywhere else. Um, I think there are reasons to think that that might. Uh, be changing uh, now as a result of, of, of some of the developments that um, are, are underway, not just in the Pakistan case and Afghanistan and, and, and some of the developments there, but um, but, but Syria as, as, as well and some of these other cases. So I think there are a few facets where um, uh, it's some of these don't necessarily have total immediacy for uh, Australia or uh, New Zealand, but I think they're, they're long-term developments in the region that's still really quite critical across a number of traditional and non-traditional um, security threats that everyone is facing. Uh, my name is Yogesh. Sorry, my throat is very bad. Uh, <coughs> I have been, uh, the last particular question, you, know, you all cover up what I wanted to ask you, but beyond than that, uh, you have not mentioned in the entire presentation uh, the Americans, what's the role of Americans? And I know that you would not like to digress from CPEG, but you did mention about Indian uh, interest and Indian long-term perspective. Probably the Americans also have a uh, short-term and strategic interest and in how that interest would help or uh, oppose that CPEG, success of CPEG. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the Americans are relatively po sympathetic towards a lot of what CPEC is 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 trying to do. Um, I mean, there was a period of time when Richard Holbrook would go and have these meetings in, in Beijing and basically say, you know, we can't get through the level of economic support that would be needed to um, help the Pakistani economy in various critical sectors. Can't you guys do it? Um, and so for a lot of what's actually being done in the context of, um, of, of these projects, I, they're things that... The, the, the U.S. has been keen to see China do for uh, for, for some time. Um, uh, I think the sense of China taking on somewhat greater responsibility for trying to push um, uh, some of these economic projects um, in the right direction and, and really coming in um, to look at what's going on in the Pakistani economy um, and say, uh, you know, developments here... Um, uh, constitute, um, if, if, if not successfully addressed, um, uh, constitute a strategic risk that we should also um, be, be, be worried about. And so in that, there's, there's various facets of that, but the U.S. is, um, is, is quite pleased to see China taking on um, a heightened role, whether it's CPEC, but also more broadly um, in the region, where I think they've been quite 
uh, who have certainly been very positively disposed towards seeing China weigh in much more actively on Afghanistan um, uh, than it was. And that's really been quite a close area of coordination between the two sides, even with all the other strategic differences between them. Um, you almost got when Nawaz Sharif was in, in the US for a visit um, earlier this year, I think it would have been earlier this year, um, and a, a, a joint statement actually supporting CPEC or something to that e effect. Um, the objections to it were there's gas-fired power stations, there were environmental caveats and things, so it didn't end up going into the statement. We didn't not go into, the, into a joint statement because of some kind of profound objection to it. Um, even in the last uh, strategic and economic dialogue, um, the big kind of conclave between the Americans and, and the Chinese, Pakistan was one of the areas that was being looked at as well as you know other areas of complementarity um, here. Now, going to the previous question, questions about Guadar, dual use ports, China's naval role, these sorts of things, um, I still think there are parts of the Indian Ocean where you don't have yet the level of strategic concern and the uh, the view that says that the two sides are in entering into pure strategic competition that you do in the Asia Pacific, um, and so I think some of the risk, some of the, the the views when it comes to that. I mean, there are sensitivities. I don't, I don't think there is so much. Um, uh, I, I think dual use ports are one of the the, the 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 sort of other question marks when it comes to some of these geoeconomic projects that that exist. Um, on the U.S. side. Um, but I, I think it's still, for now, I think the balance of considerations when it comes to Pakistan and, in another context, Afghanistan, um, is the threats from instability, militancy, terrorism, um, are of higher salience um, for the United States, um, and that, therefore, rather than enveloping some of this in the context of some of the other areas of strategic competition um, in East Asia, uh, this is actually a zone where a greater level of Chinese assertiveness is actually seen as being relatively helpful. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nishank. I'm from the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy. Um, Andrew, you described in your presentation uh, Chinese generals, uh, I quote, Pakistan is China's Israel, and another instance you said uh, Pakistan is China's one and only real ally. I <clears throat> am interested to know uh, to what extent is China willing to uh, make good of its alliance or stick its neck out for Pakistan in its relations with, say, India, the United States, or any other actor? Is there substance in this alliance beyond the procurement side of the relationship, beyond the security uh, send, uh, side where both countries gain from each other, but more so about to what extent is it willing to stick out its neck mm. for Pakistan? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think the th this is where the, the use of the fuzzy use of ally can be quite um, unhelpful, um, I think, because um, uh, and that quote that quote was from um, Yan Shui Tong, I think. Um, uh, in fact, I'm just seeing someone who works with Yan Shui Tong, um, a friend. Um, uh, but I think, I mean, of course, China only has one formal alliance commitment, which is to North Korea. Um, uh, and non-alignment has been a central part of its policy for so long. And um, Pakistan has, at a few junctures, asked to upgrade the defense relationship into something that is a treaty alliance, um, or you know, some, something that in incorporates treaty um, commitments um, on China's part. Um, there are some kind of protocols to a defense agreement that was reached that are non-public um, uh, that may have some elements of this, but they're not, um, uh, they're, they're not treaty commitments um, uh, of, of a certain nature. And when Pakistan has... Um, asked China to, to, to do this, it's, it, it said uh, no, and it said no at, 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 at certain um, different junctures. Um, what you're talking about still is, uh, and, and I think the model element of the relationship is a close uh, and uh, a, a high level of trust and coordination, um, but that doesn't involve putting China on the hook in any of these situations. Um, uh, and that's partly, of course, as well because of the, the fairly substantial number of occasions in which if there had been any of these commitments, China would have been um, in, a, in a difficult spot. But I mean, there are other more important considerations that, that, that were overriding. Um, I, I think there are a number of these occasions as well where um, if you look at you know, the last couple of decades and you look at questions of culpability, if you're looking at 99, if you're looking at Mumbai, if you're looking at these, 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 these cases, 2001, 2002, Twin Peaks, I mean, a number of these instances, um, uh, I, I, I think 
Um, you've seen the role that China's played in, in these cases. In the case of Cargill, um, they encourage Pakistan to, to pull its forces back. Um, uh, and so this has been this kind of parallel thing for all of the, the it is an extremely close partnership, but the sense has been um, we will help to provide the capabilities, but in a number of these crisis situations, we don't necessarily agree with what you're doing. Now, it, let's if you, if you flip that and you say there's a situation in which um, there are actions taken, say, by India um, uh, or the US um, uh, that uh, China, but I think the Indian case is, 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 is the interesting one. Um, there's, there's an action taken by India that China sees as disproportionate, that China sees as harming Pakistan um, in some fundamental way. And kind of, if you debate this out from certain, with certain people on the Chinese side, I think there may be a willingness to swing in in a way that hasn't been, 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 been seen in the last stretch because of the particular dynamics of how these situations have, have, have played out. Um, and that even comes down to some of the, you can even talk about that in terms of, in some of the nuclear context, um, of how some of those eventualities might play out. Might China engage in signaling um, or something during a, a crisis that is seen to be largely of India's making, for instance. There's, there are some questions there. Um, and I think diplomatically, China does back Pakistan up on, on some of these things. The most obvious case is you know, China does provide protection to various individuals um, on the sanctions committee of the UN Security Council. Um, I think you can see some of the, what went on at the NSG um, in the last stretch, not just as an India-related question, but also as China wanting to ensure parity for, for, for the two sides and, and looking out for Pakistan's um, interests in this respect. Um, and some of these things come at a cost. I mean, it does come at a cost in, in the relationship with, with India diplomatically, um, not um, uh, in, 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 you know, in sort of security stakes that would be uh, in, involved in, in a wartime scenario, but I mean, th these things do come at a, um, at a cost. Um, and I, I think now you do have a broader based, I mean, this is, I think, the big development now. You have a much broader based commitment um, on, on China's part uh, to the relationship as a result of the depth of uh, these intended economic ties. And I think that will change the standing. It also means there are lots more Chinese um, uh, uh, workers and individuals in Pakistan. Uh, there are certain forms of naval cooperation that could involve Chinese uh, assets. Uh, being based in Pakistan, which does complicate and raise additional questions if you were, again, talking about uh, a wartime scenario or, or, or something like that. Um, last thing, I mean, on the U.S., one another test instance of this, though, is on the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. China still wants Pakistan to have a good relationship with the United States. And this comes back to this role that China sees Pakistan uh, playing. China wants Pakistan to continue to be an effective, play this effective balancing role um, have healthy relations with all sides, et cetera, et cetera. And it sees that the, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship helps to facilitate that. It wants Pakistan to get U.S. weapons. Um, it wants um, uh, uh, Pakistan uh, uh, to get U.S. financial support when, when, when necessary. And so when, for instance, after the bin Laden raid in Abbottabad, uh, some on the Pakistani side were sort of looking to China at that juncture to uh, kind of swing in in a certain fashion, um, uh, China was quite clear, no, you have to fix your relationship with the United States. We'll back you up on some critical areas, we'll protect, including, you know, if, if, if they attempt to bring sanctions against some members of the, uh, of the Pakistani army, we'll, you know, we'll block whatever we need to block, but you need to fix your relationship with, with, with the US. So it's, it's kind of, there are nuanced elements um, to this, and I, I think it does involve important commitments on, um, on China's part, but it doesn't and won't, I think, involve some of the kind of actual treaty commitments of the sort that um, uh, would, would be a part of what would be a real alliance. You, so I thought about it from that defense. You sort of touched upon the issue with the Bin Laden um, episode, but how does China view um, that forest border between Afghanistan and Pakistan and the uh, Pakistan and Taliban and all sorts of things in right on its doorstep, basically, but their own issues with the uh, Muslim separatists. Mm. Um, so, I mean, there's a couple of elements to it. First of all, there's the, the direct border elements, um, and uh, I think there's still not, I mean, the borders are locked down. I mean, there's, there's no, there's very little movement in or out when it comes to, uh, to that. So, in terms of kind of what are seen as 
spill, direct spillover effects, despite the proximity, um, I think it's it's seen as less a kind of uh, immediate um, spillover risks and and more about some of the ties that exist between various groups, the inspirational effect. Um, but you, of course, had a period of time through uh, through the 90s, through the late 90s, in which you had training camps for um, uh, uh, certain militant um, groups um, in, in Afghanistan, um, the group that China calls ETIM, um, and then they were in North Waziristan for some time. So this was the location um, in which uh, the one group that um, does explicitly target China, um, uh, they were uh, located in this fuzzy uh, border space. I think they're, they're, they're basically back in, probably in Badakhshan at the moment, seems to be the, the, the assessment at the moment of the of, of the, head, uh, the headquarters of the group. Um, uh, but um, uh, so the, the, some, some of the specific groups have been cause for concern. The broad cause for concern has been the kind of macro implications for stability in the region if some of these groups um, uh, are able to uh, either uh, achieve some uh, a problematic level of success in Afghanistan that would repeat the kind of 90s scenario um, or if they destabilize Pakistan itself. So that's been a kind of macro concern. Um, but um, the very direct question has been the uh, ha has been the other repeat of the 90s question, which is, could you have a safe space established again for uh, uh, some of these militant groups to, to, to have their um, to, to have their base? And that has been why you've seen China weigh in quite as actively on um, on Afghanistan policy um, as, as as they have. Um, at the same time, they're still very cautious about. Um, uh, the handling of, of, of a number of these groups and about Pakistan's role um, in, uh, in, in, in doing so. Um, the Pakistani Taliban problem is, of course, partly a problem of um, uh, precisely the, the, the kind of scenario, a, a worst-case scenario that you, you might see on, on, on China's part if there were to be a more definitive split between the Pakistani government and the Afghan Taliban. Um, uh, and what that might amount to, for instance. And so if, you can't, if it comes down to questions of how much pressure, for instance, China might put on, um, on Pakistan on, on, on some of these issues, there, there are very precise parameters um, to it. And I, China's still been very reliant on Pakistan for its intelligence, for navigating some of these relationships, even for kind of judgment calls on these things. China's familiarity with a number of these groups, um, although it's had contacts with them and um, uh, things, it's not comfortable um, and uh, at ease in, in dealing with, um, uh, with with this entire space. And the one country it, it trusts uh, up to a point um, on, on these things has been uh, Pakistan. Um, so it's still dependent to, to, to a significant extent um, uh, on the Pakistani uh, state and on the ISI and, and, and others to, to sort of make calls that are also attuned to China's interests, but of course have... have have, have other purposes as well. But what you have seen over the last uh, year or two in particular has been a much more serious attempt to build up relationships with, with, with other um, entities in the region as well. So, you know, you've seen the first package of military aid to Afghanistan. Um, you've seen this big rotation of Chinese uh, military and intelligence officials going through Afghanistan. So there's a much more independent relationship being built up with, um, uh, with, with Kabul as well. But um, the Pakistan... Uh, relationship and, um, and Pakistani uh, army's kind of proclivities around this are still going to uh, dominate, and there's, 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 there are limits to what China is is is, is, um, is going to do to, uh, to to try to push that in another direction. So.